It's a tale of age versus youth set in a fantasy world filled with adventure, host to a never-ending battle between the adults who want to maintain power and the kids who seek to disrupt it. But you can't get there from here unless you believe in your heart that it's possible and have a plan to take on the most powerful corporations in film and television entertainment. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Go to nordvpn.com slash toygalaxy to get the two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus a bonus gift on top. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. What can NordVPN do for you? It can give you a lot more privacy when you're online. No one else needs to access the files you're moving around. NordVPN helps protect your communications and personal data and makes hacking close to impossible. Whether you're sitting in a public place like the food court at the mall or sipping a coffee at the local bookstore, shopping a domestic website or an international one, NordVPN makes sure your money and your transaction are private. Visit whatever sites you want, whenever and wherever. If you're traveling, get better prices on flight tickets, car hires, and hotels. Book virtually from a different country and get the best quotes. Get the most out of your subscription and keep up with favorite series. Change the country to access streaming services and providers. NordVPN makes it easy to watch HBO Max or Netflix as if you were sitting in your own living room. And it helps me keep up with all my favorite tokusatsu shows coming out of Japan that haven't yet and may never be broadcast in the U.S. So go to nordvpn.com slash toygalaxy to get the two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus bonus gift on top. That's nordvpn.com slash toygalaxy. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. And thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates is a 65-episode animated series that ran one season from September of 1990 to September of 1991. It was part of an attempt to boldly position the brand new Fox network as an equal to the long-standing big three of NBC, CBS, and ABC, a fourth option for kids' cartoon programs. It's the story you've known all this time, joined already in progress. Kids from our world, Wendy and her brothers, Michael and John, crossed over into the magical world of adventure called Neverland. Living for now alongside Peter Pan, the boy who never grows up. A magical child soaring beyond the clouds with his friend, the fairy Tinkerbell, and the lost boys. Kids like themselves who came to Neverland long ago and never returned home. It's fast and fun with new encounters every day, from Tiger Lily and her village to mermaids to dwarves, trolls, and King Kairos, the Ice King of Neverland. But they'll have to be careful because danger lurks around every corner. Captain Hook and his pirate cronies try to destroy Peter and his pals. Sword fights, sea battles, man-eating crocodiles. It's all part of the magic of foxes, Peter Pan and the pirates. Peter Pan was created by J.M. Barry in the early 1900s. Peter's first literary appearance was in a story called The Little White Bird, published in 1902. The character took off when Barry's stage production Peter Pan or The Boy Who Wouldn't Grow Up debuted in 1904, and furthermore, was expanded into Barry's novel called Peter and Wendy in 1911. Those early works, especially the play and the novel, established the foundation of the Peter Pan mythos. The boy who wouldn't grow up, who can fly, who literally laughs in the face of danger. Wendy, the girl who is on the verge of becoming an adult, but still believing in magical things as a child does. Her adventure to Neverland with her brothers Michael and John, and becoming mother to the Lost Boys. Meeting the fairy Tinkerbell, mermaids, Tiger Lily, all of them threatened by pirates and their leader, the terrible Captain Hook, who himself is menaced by a crocodile that both haunts and hunts him. Barry was already a successful author prior to the creation of Peter Pan. The success of Pan and his adventures elevated him to a higher degree of pop culture fame and fortune. In 1929, Barry gave the rights for Peter Pan to Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. It was a gift that provided essential funding for the hospital as they received payment for licensing the property for all performances and adaptations of Peter Pan, as well as royalties from any sales. It was a gift that benefited the hospital for decades after Barry's death in 1937 and continues today, as of this video. As new media technologies emerged, Peter Pan adaptations predictably followed. The first movie was released by Paramount Pictures in 1924. The most influential version, nearly 30 years later in 1953, was Walt Disney Pictures' animated feature based on Barry's 1904 stage production called simply Peter Pan. Disney's adaptation monopolized the public perception of the character for decades, in many cases leading audiences to believe that it was a completely original creation of Walt Disney Studios, aka standard operating procedure for Disney over decades of literary appropriation. That changed in 1987. Copyright law at the time allowed for a period of 50 years after the creator's death before the works entered public domain, which then allowed anyone to use those characters any way they wanted to without licensing or paying a royalty. 
That meant J.M. Barrie's 1904 play and his 1911 novel were officially up for grabs for anyone who wanted to make an adaptation. In Europe, that protected period was extended another 20 years to 2007. In the U.S., it was game, game on. on. Game on! U.S. television network CBS, one of the big three along with ABC and NBC, were first to begin development of a Peter Pan animated series inspired by the original works of J.M. Barry, something fully within their legal rights to do. In 1989, Disney became aware of the series CBS was working on and promptly sent them a message. According to a 1990 article in the LA Times, Disney Studios chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg promptly reached out to CBS executives to tell them that Disney didn't want anyone doing such a show. According to the article, Katzenberg said CBS should give up their series, quote, if it isn't of the essence to you. With other sources suggesting that Katzenberg threatened all out corporate war. Message sent, message received. Understanding that the streets of Neverland belonged to Disney, CBS dropped the show and compensated producers for the work they had already done. CBS understood that that's how business has always been done. No need to upset the status quo. Unless that was the reason your business existed in the first place. In 1986, Fox began broadcasting with the explicit intent of becoming the fourth major US television network on a mission to upset five decades of exclusivity for ABC, CBS, and NBC. By 1989, Fox had grown stronger, powered mostly by their groundbreaking, pop culture reshaping monster hit The Simpsons. And not for nothing, but they were still reeling from the damage inflicted by Disney's sudden betrayal of their trust, of their friendship, the revocation of DuckTales. <laughs> DuckTales premiered in 1987 and likely due to a friendship between Disney head Michael Eisner and Fox CEO Barry Diller was broadcast on many Fox affiliates during their rise to prominence. When Disney pulled DuckTales from Fox to make it the foundation of their new Disney afternoon block of programming, Diller was devastated. Wounds like that cut the deepest. They last the longest. They demand retaliation of disproportionate magnitude. Some say tis better to have loved DuckTales and lost than never to have loved DuckTales at all. But others believe that the loss of DuckTales may be victory in disguise. The lowest ebb is the turn of the tide. It was at that point that Fox brought the full force of their programming powers to bear, creating a new Fox Children's Network headed by entertainment veteran Margaret Lesh, former CEO of Marvel Productions. Announced in July of 1990, it would have an all-new slate of Fox programming for kids and, as its foundation, the abandoned CBS Peter Pan series to be known henceforth as Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates. Disney dispatched a team captained by Vice Chairman Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew, to meet with Fox directly to share their concerns about what Disney would consider infringement on their intellectual property. For example, from the same 1990 LA Times article, Disney suggested that maybe Fox should make Tinkerbell a single point of light and not a young woman. That idea, they claimed, had come from Walt and his animators. To which Fox pointed out that J.M. Barry's actual description of Tinkerbell was, quote, a slightly plump girl gowned in a skeleton leaf through which her figure could be seen to best advantage. According to an article on CartoonResearch.com, Fox was more than able to demonstrate the very obvious differences in terms of characterization, tone, and character design. Peter had a ragged brown outfit with a short cape and kept his knife in his right boot, not his waistband. Tinkerbell had red hair, wore a cap, and talked. Captain Hook had a white powdered wig, was clean shaven, and his hook was on his right hand instead of his left. And since the original novel was public domain, the Fox version was obviously inspired by it and not the Disney feature, with Fox saying, probably, I don't know, read the book, chumps. Fox Kids brings you a lesson in translating pirate to regular English. Row, you stoop shouldered geeksies! Row for your lives! Translation, get me out of here! Is Captain Hook the meanest, most eloquent pirate ever? Or is his hook just screwed on too tight? You beady-eyed, brainless troglodyte! Even Peter Pan doesn't get him. I don't know what you said. But it's all a part of the adventure of Fox's Peter Pan and the pirates. We days on Fox Kids. Fox pressed on with their development of Peter Pan and the Pirates, spending very big bucks to get it to broadcast. No amount of money was too much to put a stick in Mickey Mouse's stupid eye. In a March 1990 article by Kay Gardella, Margaret Lesh put that number at or around $18 million for 65 episodes. Fox liked Peter Pan not just because of the opportunity to avenge the loss of DuckTales, but rather because, as Lesh put it, Peter Pan is a story that appeals to a wide breadth of children. It's a fantasy. It's an adventure. It's a comedy. It has drama, content 
conflict and magic. It is filled with what we think children love to be part of, and that is the magic of imagination. Never Never Land represents a child's dream. Telling Disney to fuck off is just a bonus. I added that last part. Telling Disney to fuck off comes with the pressure of delivering the goods. Lesh had to make aggressive moves to keep the production on track for its September 1990 premiere. In fact, when it first aired, only a few episodes were finished. According to CartoonResearch.com, Lesh had to shuffle animation production from studio to studio around the globe, sharing the labor to maintain quality, but more importantly, just finish the damn thing. From Project X in LA to 10 other animation studios in Korea, Taiwan, China, Japan, Canada, the Philippines, and the Soviet Union. Some of that $18 million budget went to the cast, headlined by Tim Curry as Captain Hook, a role which earned him a Daytime Emmy Award. Peter Pan was played by Jason, not James Marsden. Tinkerbell was brought to life by Debbie Derryberry. The rest of the cast included veterans like Tony Jay, Chris Summer, Adam Carl, Jack Angel, Linda Gary, and Kath Susie. This was to be a marquee animated series. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates began airing in September of 1990 on Fox-affiliated stations as part of the new Fox Children's Network block of programming, alongside shows like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Bobby's World, Tom and Jerry Kids, and Pigsburg Pigs. By the time Peter Pan and the Pirates was airing, the budget had surged with Lesh stating that, quote, the figure $20 million has been bandied around, but believe me, when we finish, we will have spent more than $20 million. We've had production problems, and that's no secret, but I'm happy with the end product. Disney, on the other hand, was not happy with the end product. Having backed down from a previous lawsuit over copyright infringement of Peter Pan specifically, Disney continued on with a much more impactful suit over antitrust concerns. Disney claimed that Fox's creation of the Fox Children's Network was an attempt to block Disney from airing their new DuckTales-led Disney Afternoon block of programming on Fox affiliates and was patently against the law. Disney claimed that Fox was essentially forcing Fox affiliates to air Fox's cartoons over Disney's cartoons, which they had no legal right to do. That lawsuit was eventually dropped by Disney in January of 1992, just a few months after the last original episode of Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates aired. Disney Studios president Rich Frank said, quote, both studios were successful with their cartoon shows and it is time to put this issue behind us. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates continued to air reruns as late as 1997 and then again on Fox Family in 1998, any concerns about infringement or market confusion long abandoned. Fox having moved on from Peter Pan to more bankable properties like Batman, the X-Men, and the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates was supported by licensed merchandise including a Tiger Electronics LCD handheld game, watches, sticker books, THQ produced a line of action figures and plush dolls. Peter Pan, Wendy, Tinkerbell, Captain Hook, Smee, Robert Mullins, and more. THQ was the company founded by one of the former owners of LJN after LJN was purchased by Acclaim. THQ would eventually transition to video games as well, including one for Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991, a side-scrolling action game that puts Peter's, Peter's players in the pants of the players. <laughs> puts players in the Peter's pan pants. <laughs> Why did I write it like that? <laughs> Including one for Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates, released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991, a side-scrolling action game that puts players in Peter Pan's shoes, collecting fairy dust and battling your way through pirates to face off once and for all with Captain Hook himself. <laughs> That's why you read shit out loud! <laughs> In Germany, Baste Verlag published seven issues of a Peter Pan and the Pirates comic book series, all new stories unique to the books based on the Fox cartoon. If you missed out on Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates when it originally aired or during subsequent reruns, some episodes were released on VHS. A 2004 DVD released in the UK featured a selection of episodes. The best way to check it out now would be to watch it here, unofficially, on YouTube, because it is highly unlikely the series will ever be officially released. Because for all the bluster, for all the legal machinations and infringement concerns, Disney played the long game. After years of kids programming success, Fox relinquished the top kids rating spots to ABC's One Saturday Morning in 1996, and then again to Kids WB in 1997. By 2000, the landscape of kids entertainment had drastically shifted thanks to the expansion of cable operations targeting specific demographics, Nickelodeon in particular crushing all who dared step up. Traditional networks were taking back weekday afternoons and Saturdays for adult programming. In 2001, Disney purchased Fox Family, Fox Kids Europe, and Fox Family Worldwide, which included Saban Entertainment, as well as Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates. Fox Kids itself was rolled back into Fox Television Entertainment, and all daytime children's programming was discontinued, replaced by a block of programming called Fox Box, produced by 4Kids Entertainment. 
As of this video, this year, 2023, the rights to Peter Pan are almost entirely in the public domain around the world. There have been multiple adaptations of Peter Pan since, including Steven Spielberg's Hook in 1991. Disney themselves returned to Neverland in 2002 with Return to Neverland, an official sequel to their 1953 film. Universal released Peter Pan in 2003. Sci-Fi had Neverland in 2011. NBC produced Peter Pan Live in 2014, starring Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. Warner Brothers Pan in 2015. Wendy, a drastic reimagining of the mythos by director Ben Zeitlin, came out in 2020. The term of J.M. Barry's donation to the Greater Ormond Street Hospital has nearly expired. The hospital states that they retain a royalty interest without creative control based on the 1928 published stage script through the end of 2023. That coincides with Disney's plans to once again stake their claim to all things Peter Pan. A live action adaptation of their 1953 animated feature film starring Jude Law as Captain Hook called Peter Pan and Wendy is set to premiere this year exclusively on Disney+. Plus. Fox proved that with a little pixie dust, they too could laugh in the face of danger, becoming not only a fourth network, but so, so much more. A brazen attempt to scuttle the waters of the old ways by dumping buckets of kids' entertainment chum. Initiating a feeding frenzy of hungry little sharks, kids who don't care where their entertainment came from or who was making it. Kids that just wanted to set sail into adventure on the next available boat. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates was a shot fired across the bow, striking at the heart of Disney and what it claimed to be its exclusive territory. Retaliation for slights both perceived and real, a primal scream born from the loss of DuckTales. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you have ever even heard of this particular cartoon. Am, am I the only one who remembers this? No, I'm not. <laughs> We've actually had lots of requests for this over the years. There are dozens of us. That said, I did completely forget ever having watched it until I checked out an episode for this video. Captain Hook's George Washington Curls jogged that that memory right out of whatever crevice in my brain it was hiding in. Now that I know Disney owns it and will bury it forever, I can do the same. Back in that crevice, memory. <laughs> <laughs>